Anarchism and the Black Revolution, written by Lorenzo Comboa Irvin in 1993, read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz, 2022. Chapter 1 An Analysis of White Supremacy. This pamphlet will briefly discuss the nature of anarchism and its relevance to the black liberation movement. Because there have been so many lies and distortions of what anarchism really stands for by both its left and right-wing ideological opponents, it will be necessary to discuss the many popular myths about it. This, in itself, deserves a book, but is not the intention of this pamphlet, which is merely to introduce the black movement to revolutionary anarchist ideals. It is up to the reader to determine whether these new ideas are valid and worthy of adoption. How the Capitalists Use Racism The fate of the white working class has always been bound with the condition of black workers. Going as far back as the American colonial period when black labor was first imported into America, black slaves and indentured servants have been oppressed right along with whites of the lower classes. But when European indentured servants joined with blacks to rebel against their lot in the late 1600s, the propertied class decided to quote-unquote free them by giving them a special status as quote-unquote whites and thus a stake in the new system of oppression. Material incentives, as well as the newly elevated social status, were used to ensure these lower classes' allegiance. This invention of the quote-unquote white race and racial slavery of the Africans went hand in glove and is how the upper classes maintained order during the period of slavery. Even poor whites had aspirations of doing better since their social mobility was ensured by the new system. This social mobility, however, was on the backs of the African slaves who were super exploited. But the die had been cast for the dual tier form of labor, which exploited the African but also trapped white labor. When they sought to organize unions or for higher wages in the North or South, white laborers were slapped down by the rich who used enslaved black labor as their primary mode of production. The so called quote unquote free labor of the white worker did not stand a chance. Although the capitalists used the system of white skin privilege to great effect to divide the working class, the truth is that the capitalists only favored white workers to use them against their own interests, not because there was true quote-unquote white class unity. The capitalists didn't want white labor united with blacks against their rule and the system of exploitation and labor. The invention of the quote-unquote white race was a scam to facilitate this exploitation. White workers were bought off to allow their own wage slavery and the African super-exploitation. They struck a deal with the devil, which has hampered all efforts at class unity for the last four centuries. The continual subjugation of the masses depends on competition and internal disunity. As long as discrimination exists and racial or ethnic minorities are oppressed, the entire working class is oppressed and weakened. This is so because the capitalist class is able to use racism to drive down the wages of individual segments of the working class by inciting racial antagonism and forcing a fight for jobs and services. This division is a development that ultimately undercuts the living standards of all workers. Moreover, by pitting whites against blacks and other oppressed nationalities, the capitalist class is able to prevent workers from uniting against their common class enemy. As long as workers are fighting each other, capitalist class rule is secure. If an effective resistance is to be mounted against the current racist offensive of the capitalist class, the utmost solidarity between workers of all races is essential. The way to defeat the capitalist strategy is for white workers to defend the democratic rights won by blacks and other oppressed peoples after decades of hard struggle and to fight to dismantle the system of white skin privilege. White workers should support and adopt the concrete demands of the black movement and should work to abolish the white identity entirely. These white workers should strive for multicultural unity and should work with black activists to build an anti-racist movement to challenge white supremacy. However, 
It is also very important to recognize the right of the black movement to take an independent road in its own interests. That is what self-determination means. Race and class, the combined character of black oppression. Because of the way this nation has developed with the exploitation of African labor and the maintenance of an internal colony, blacks and other non-white peoples are oppressed both as members of the working class and as a racial nationality. As Africans in America, they are a distinct people hounded and segregated in U.S. society. By struggling for their human and civil rights, they ultimately come into confrontation with the entire capitalist system not just individual racists or regions of the country. The truth soon becomes apparent. Blacks cannot get their freedom under this system because based on historically uneven competition, capitalist exploitation is inherently racist. At this juncture, the movement can go in the direction of revolutionary social change or limit itself to winning reforms and democratic rights within the structure of capitalism. The potential is there for either. In fact, the weakness of the 1960s civil rights movement was that it allied itself with the liberals in the Democratic Party and settled for civil rights protective legislation instead of pushing for social revolution. This self-policing by the leaders of the movement is an abject lesson about why the new movement has to be self-activated and not dependent on personalities and politicians. But if such a movement does become a social revolutionary movement, it must ultimately unite its forces with similar movements like gays, women, radical workers, and others who are in revolt against the system. For example, in the late 1960s, the Black Liberation Movement acted as a catalyst to spread revolutionary ideas and images, which brought forth the various opposition movements we see today. This is what we believe will happen again, although it is not enough to call for mindless, quote-unquote, unity, as much of the white left does. Because of the dual forms of oppression, of non-white workers, and the depth of social desperation it creates, black workers will strike first whether their potential allies are available to do so or not. This is self-determination, and that is why it is necessary for oppressed workers to build independent movements, to unite their own peoples first. This is why it is absolutely necessary for white workers to defend the democratic rights and gains of non-white workers. This self-activity of the oppressed masses, such as the Black Liberation Movement, is inherently revolutionary and is an essential part of the social revolutionary process of the entire working class. These are not marginal issues. It cannot be downgraded or ignored by white workers if a revolutionary victory is to be had. It has to be recognized as a cardinal principle by all, that oppressed peoples have a right to self-determination, including the right to run their own organizations and liberation struggle. The victims of racism know best how to fight back against it. So what type of anti-racist group is needed? The black movement needs allies in its battle against the racist capitalist class. Not the usual liberal or phony quote-unquote radical support, but genuine revolutionary working class support and solidarity otherwise called quote-unquote mutual aid by anarchists. The basis of such unity, however, must be principled and be based on class interest, rather than liberal guilt-tripping, do-gooding, or opportunism and manipulation by liberal or radical political parties. The needs of the oppressed people must be the most important consideration, but they want genuine support, not fakery or leftist rhetoric. The anarchist movement, which is overwhelmingly white, must start to understand that they need to do propaganda work among the black and other oppressed community, and they need to make it possible for non-white anarchists to organize in their communities by providing them with technical resources, printing off zines, video and audio cassette production, etc., and assisting with financial resources. One reason there are so few black anarchists is because the movement provides no means to reach people of color to win them over to anarchism and to help them organize themselves. 
This must change if we want the social revolution to take place in America, and if we want North American anarchism to be more than a quote-unquote white rights movement. The type of organization needed must be a mass organization, working to unite all workers in common class struggle, but must be able to recognize the duty to support and adopt the special demands of the black and other non-white peoples as those of the entire working class. It must challenge white supremacy on a daily basis. It must refute racist philosophy and propaganda and must counter racist mobilization and attacks with armed self-defense and street fighting when necessary. The objective of such a mass movement is to win the white working class over to an anti-white supremacy class conscious position, to unite the entire working class and to directly confront and overthrow the capitalist state and its rulers. The cooperation of and solidarity of all workers is essential for full social revolution, not just its privileged white sector. For instance, an existing organization like Anti-Racist Action, if adopting such politics as an anarchist group, should be given a higher priority by our movement. Every city and town should have ARA-type collectives, and every existing anarchist federation should have internal working groups that do work around racism and police brutality. In fact, the type of group that I am talking about would be a federation itself to coordinate struggles on the national and maybe even international level. This would be a revolutionary movement, not content to sit around and read books, elect a few black politicians or quote-unquote friends of labor to Congress or the state legislature, write protest letters, circulate petitions, or other such tame tactics. It would take the examples of the early radical labor movements like the IWW, as well as the civil rights movement of the 1960s to show that only direct action tactics of confrontation and militant protest will yield any results at all. It would also have the example of the 1992 Los Angeles Rebellion to show that people will revolt. But there need to be powerful allies extending material aid and resistance info and an existing mass movement to take it to the next step and spread the insurrection. The anarchists must recognize this and help build a militant, anti-racist group which would be both a support group for the Black Revolution and a mass organizing center to unite the class. It is very important to wrest the mass influence of the racial equality movement out of the hands of the left liberal democratic wing of the ruling class. The left liberals may talk a good fight, but as long as they are not for overthrowing capitalism and smashing the state, they will betray and sabotage the entire struggle against racism. The strategy of the left liberals is to deflect class consciousness into strictly race consciousness. They refuse to appeal on the basis of class material interests to the U.S. working and middle classes to support black rights, and as a result, allow the right wing to capitalize unopposed on the latent racist feeling among whites, as well as on their economic insecurity. The kind of movement I am proposing will step in the breach and attack white supremacy and dismantle the very threads of what holds capitalism together. Without the mass white consensus to the rule of the American state and the system of white skin privilege, capitalism could not go on into the next century. The Myth of Reverse Racism Reverse discrimination has become the war cry of all those racists trying to roll back civil rights gains won by blacks and other oppressed nationalities in housing, education, employment, and every aspect of social life. The racists feel these things should only go to white males and that, quote-unquote, minorities and women are taking them away from white men. Millions of white workers, day in and day out, are bombarded by this racist propaganda, and it is having a big impact. Many whites believe this lie of reverse discrimination against white people. This belief is embraced by many duped white workers who consider reverse discrimination to be at least partly responsible for the economic problems so many of them are suffering from today. 
Such beliefs propelled Ronald Reagan to his two terms as U.S. president. Reagan tried to use this racist propaganda line to precipitate a rollback in the civil rights gains of oppressed nationalities. The racists claim the concept of reverse discrimination suggests the wholesale discrimination against blacks and other racially oppressed groups is a hoax. Baldly stated, the idea is that the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act ended discrimination against blacks, Latinos, and other nationalities and women, and now the law is discriminating against white people. The racists say, racial minorities and women are the new privileged groups in American society. They are allegedly getting the pick of jobs, preferential college placements, the best housing, government grants, and so on at the expense of white workers. The racists say programs to end discrimination are not only unnecessary, but are actually attempts by minorities to gain power at the expense of white workers. They say blacks and women do not want equality, but rather hegemony over white workers. An anarchist, anti-racist movement would counter such propaganda and expose it as a ruling class weapon. The Civil Rights Act did not cause inflation by excessive spending on welfare, housing, or other social services. Further, blacks aren't discriminating against whites. Whites are not being herded into ghetto housing, removed from, or prohibited from entering professions, deprived of decent education, forced into malnutrition or early death, subjected to racial violence and police repression, forced to suffer disproportionate levels of unemployment and other forms of racial oppression. But for blacks, the oppression starts with birth and childhood. Infant mortality rate is nearly three times that of whites, and it continues throughout their lives. The fact is reverse discrimination is a hoax. Anti-black discrimination is not a thing of the past. It is the systematic, all-pervasive reality today. Malcolm X pointed out in the 1960s that no civil rights statutes will give black people their freedom, and asked if Africans in America were really citizens, why would civil rights be necessary? Malcolm X observed civil rights had been fought for at great sacrifice and therefore should be enforced, but if the government won't enforce the laws, then the people will have to do so, and the movement will have to pressure the government authorities to protect democratic rights. To unite the masses of people behind a working-class anti-racist movement, the following practical demands, which are a combination revolutionary and radical reformism to ensure democratic rights are necessary. First, black and white workers' solidarity. Fight racism on the job and in society. Second, full democratic and human rights for all non-white peoples. Make unions fight racism and discrimination. Third, armed self-defense against racist attacks. Build mass movement against racism and fascism. Fourth, community control of the police. Replacement of cops by community self-defense force elected by residents. End police brutality. Prosecution of all killer cops. Fifth, money for rebuilding the cities, creation of public works brigades to rebuild inner city areas made up of community residents. Sixth, full socially useful employment at union wages for all workers. End racial discrimination in jobs, training, and promotions. Establish affirmative action programs to reverse past racist employment practices. Seventh, ban the Ku Klux Klan Nazis, and other fascist organizations. Prosecution of all racists for attacks on people of color. Eighth, free open admissions to all institutions of learning for all of those qualified to attend. No racial exclusion in higher education. Ninth, end taxes of workers and poor. Tax the rich and major corporations. Tenth, Full health and medical care for all persons and communities, regardless of race and class. Eleventh, free all political prisoners and innocent victims of racial injustice. Abolish prisons. Fight 
economic disparity. Twelfth, rank and file democratic control of the unions by building an anarcho-syndicalist labor movement. Make unions active in social issues. Thirteenth, stop racist harassment and discrimination of undocumented workers. Smash the right wing. Quote, Fascism is not to be debated. It is to be smashed. Unquote. Buenaventura Duruti, Spanish anarchist revolutionary, 1936. As capitalist society decays, people will look for radical and total solutions to the miseries that they face. The Nazis and the Klan are among the few right-wing political forces that offer, or appear to offer, a radical answer to the current problems of society for the white masses. That these solutions are false will matter little to confused and hysterical people searching desperately for a way out of the socio-economic crisis the capitalist world is facing. Sections of the middle class, better off layers of the white working class, poor and unemployed white workers, all poisoned by the racism of this society, are easy prey for Nazi and Klan demagogues. The Nazis, skinheads, and the Klan are the most extreme right-wing racist fascist organizations in the United States. Today, these groups are small, and many liberals like to downplay the threat they represent, even to argue for their legal quote-unquote rights to spread their racist venom. But these groups have a tremendous growth potential and could become a mass movement in a surprisingly short period of time, especially during an economic and political crisis like we are now in. Basing themselves on alienated white social forces, the Nazis and the Klan are trying to build a mass movement that can hire itself out to the capitalists at the proper moment and assume state power. When the capitalists feel that they might need an additional club to keep the workers and the oppressed in line, they will turn to the Nazis, Klan, and similar right-wing organizations with both money and support, in addition to strengthening the state police and military forces. If need be, the capitalists will place them in power, as they did in Spain, Germany, and Italy in the 1920s and 30s, so the fascists will smash the unions and other working-class organizations and place blacks, Latinos, gays, Asians, and Jews into concentration camps and turn the rest of the workers into state slaves. Fascism is the ultimate authoritarian society when in power, even though it has changed its face to a mixture of crude racism and smoother racism in the modern democratic state. So in addition to the Nazis and the Klan, there are other right-wing forces that have been on the rise in the last 15 years. They include ultra-conservative rightist politicians and Christian fundamentalist preachers, along with the extreme right section of the capitalist ruling class itself. Small business owners, talk show hosts like Rush Limbaugh, along with the professors, economists, philosophers, and others in academia providing the ideological weaponry for the capitalist offensive against the workers and oppressed people. Not all the racists wear sheets. These are the quote-unquote respectable racists, the new right conservatives who are far more dangerous than the Klan or Nazis because their politics have become acceptable to large masses of white workers who in turn blame racial minorities for their problems. The capitalist class has already shown their willingness to use this conservative movement as a smokescreen for an attack on the labor movement, black struggle, and the entire working class. Many city public workers have been fired. Schools, hospitals, and other social services have been curtailed. Government agencies have been privatized. Welfare roles have been cut drastically. And the budgets of city and state governments slashed. Banks have even used their dictatorial powers to demand these budget cuts, and to even make entire cities default if they did not submit. This even happened to New York City in the 1970s, so this is not just an issue of poor, dumb rednecks in the hoods. This is about hoods in business suits. A first step in organizing and preparing the working class in the economic crisis we face is to directly take on the right-wing threat. Repressive economic legislation by conservative politicians to punish the poor and working class must be defeated. 
taxes on the rich and major corporations must be increased, while taxes on the workers and farmers must be abolished. If the politicians will not do it, we will organize a tax boycott to force them to do it. The Nazis and Klan must be confronted through direct action. Anarchists, the left, and labor organizations must organize to defend workers and oppressed from physical assaults by the racist, as well as hold mass demonstrations in the streets at fascist rallies. We must also oppose scum like Operation Rescue that use violent fascist tactics against women's rights to abortions. It is part of the same battleground. Here is the situation. David Duke, the quote-unquote ex-Klansman, is now part of the quote-unquote respectable right, which picks up support among the upper middle class. Meanwhile, the Klan and Nazi skinheads are making headway among different social layers, mainly poor white workers and the unemployed white youth. Tom Metzger, the leader of white Aryan resistance, called the Nazi skinheads his brown shirts of the 90s. This is very dangerous, but we cannot leave these people to the Nazis and Klan uncontested. We should try to win them over or at least neutralize any active opposition on their part. This is a defensive tactic at the very least, but really, we have no choice, and it is part of our revolutionary duty to organize the entire working class anyways. We should direct propaganda to these workers to expose the Nazis and Klan for the scum that they are, and show how the workers are being misled. We should also make it possible for them to fight this misery against the real enemy, the capitalist class. But in addition to defensive operations for propaganda, we must take direct offensive action to physically resist the racists when this is possible. For example, where the balance of forces allows it, we must organize to forcefully drive the Nazis and Klan off the streets. In order to smash their movements, we must organize commando-type actions to attack their rallies, close their bookshops and newspapers, destroy their meeting halls, and break up their marches. Since the Nazis and Klan organize by threatening and using violence, we must be prepared to reply to them in kind, but in a better organized and more effective way. For instance, pigs like David Duke and Tom Metzger, who have been advocating and leading the fascist movement in America, should be assassinated. We should infiltrate Klan and Nazi demonstrations in order to assault leaders and disrupt them, or hide at a distance and snipe at them with high power with high-powered rifles. I have always felt that underground guerrilla movements like the Black Liberation Army, Weather Underground, and New World Liberation Front should have attacked fascist movements and assassinated their leaders. If we cripple the fascists in this fashion, we can smash the entire right and begin to smash the state. This is the only way to stop fascists. Death to the Klan and all fascists. None other than Adolf Hitler has been quoted as saying, only one thing could have stopped our movement. If our adversaries had understood its principle and from the first day had smashed with the utmost brutality the nucleus of our new movement, unquote. We should take heed. One other thing that we must do and is something which tactically separates us anarchists from the Marxist-Leninists is that we use our studies of the authoritarian personality to help us organize against fascist recruitment. All the ML's united fronts care about is a strict political approach to defeat fascism and prevent them from attaining state power, while being able to usher the Communist Party in instead. They organize liberals and others into mass coalitions just to seize power and then crush all radical and liberal ideological opponents after they get done with the fascists. That is why Stalinist quote-unquote communist states resemble fascist police states so much in refusing to allow ideological plurality. They are both totalitarian. For that matter, how much difference was there really between Stalin and Hitler? So I say that merely physically beating back the fascists is not the issue. We need to study what accounts for the mass psychology of fascism and then defeat it ideologically, going to the core of the deep-seated racist beliefs, emotions, and authoritarian conditioning of those workers 
who support fascism and all police state authority. The third prong of our strategy is to organize among the workers and other oppressed sections of society with a program that addresses their needs. As has been said, the Klan and Nazis recruit among certain social layers, overwhelmingly white youth who are hard-pressed by the economic crisis. These people see blacks, Latinos, Asians, gays, women, and radical movements as a threat. They are racist, reactionary, and potentially very violent. Fearful that they will lose the little they have, they buy the myth that the problem is those people trying to steal their jobs, homes, future, etc., rather than the decay of the capitalist system. As long as there appears to be no alternative to fighting over a shrinking social pie, the fascists with their simple-minded quote-unquote solutions will get a hearing among the degenerate elements of the working class. The only way to undercut the appeal of the right is to organize a libertarian workers' movement that can fight for and win the things that people need. Jobs, decent housing in schools, health care, etc. This can demonstrate concretely that there is an alternative to the right wing's poisonous quote unquote solutions, and if it can win and it can win to the ranks of the workers' movement some of those people attracted to the fascist movement. In all areas of our organizing, we must carry out consistent revolutionary propaganda explaining capitalism is responsible for unemployment, for rising prices, for rotten schools and housing, and the rest of the decay that we see around us. We must expose the fact that while the Nazis, Klan, and other right-wingers make black, gay, Latinos, and other oppressed people the scapegoat for the economic crisis— their real aim is to destroy the entire workers' movement, to commit genocide, to start an adventuristic war and turn workers into outright slaves of the state. Therefore, these fascist forces are a threat to all workers of every nationality. It must be explained that they only want to use white workers as pawns in their scheme to create a fascist dictatorship, and all workers must unite and fight back and overthrow the state if they are to be free. Death to the Klan. Death to the Nazis. Defeat White Supremacy The very means of class control by the rich is the least understood. White supremacy is more than just a set of ideas or prejudices. It is national oppression. Yet to most white people, the term conjures up images of the Nazis or Ku Klux Klan rather than the system of white skin privileges that really undergirds the capitalist system in the U.S. Most white people, anarchists included, believe in essence that black people are the same, quote-unquote, as whites, and that we should just fight around common issues rather than deal with, quote-unquote, racial matters, if they see any urgency in dealing with the matter at all. Some will not raise it in such a blunt fashion. They will say that class issues should take precedence. But it means the same thing. They believe it's possible to put off the struggle against white supremacy until after the revolution, when in fact there will be no revolution if white supremacy is not attacked and defeated first. They won't win a revolution in the U.S. until they fight to improve the lot of blacks and oppressed people who are being deprived of their democratic rights, as well as being super-exploited as workers. Almost from the very inception of the North American socialist movement, the simple-minded economist position that all black and white workers have to do to wage a revolution is to engage in a quote-unquote common economic struggle has been used to avoid struggle against white supremacy. In fact, the white left has always taken the chauvinist position that since the white working class is the revolutionary vanguard anyway, why worry about an issue that will quote-unquote divide the class? Historically, anarchists have not even brought up the matter of race politics as one anarchist referred to it the first time this pamphlet was published. This is a total evasion of the issue. Yet, it is the capitalist bourgeoisie that creates inequality, 
as a way to divide and rule over the entire working class. White skin privilege is a form of domination by capital over white labor, as well as oppressed nationality labor, not just providing material incentives to quote-unquote buy off white workers to capitalism and set them against black and other oppressed workers. This explains the obedience of white labor to capitalism and the state. The white working class does not see their better-off condition as part of the system of exploitation. After centuries of political and social indoctrination, they feel their privileged position is just and proper, and what is more, has been quote-unquote earned. They feel threatened by social gains of non-white workers, which is why they so vehemently opposed affirmative action plans to benefit minorities in jobs and hiring, and to redress years of discrimination against them. It is also why white workers have opposed most civil rights legislation. Yet it is the day-to-day -day workings of white supremacy that we must fight most vigorously. We cannot remain ignorant or indifferent to the workings of race and class under this system, so that oppressed workers remain victimized. For years, blacks have been, quote, first hired, first fired by capitalist industry. Further, seniority systems have engaged in open racial discrimination and are little more than white job trusts. Blacks have even been driven out of whole industries, such as coal mining. Yet the white labor bosses have never objected or intervened on behalf of their class brothers, nor will they if not pressed up against the wall by white workers. As pointed out, there are material incentives to this white worker opportunism. Better jobs, higher pay, improved living conditions in white communities, etc., in short, what has come to be known as the, quote, white middle class lifestyle, unquote. This is what labor and the left have always fought to maintain, not class solidarity, which would necessitate a struggle against white supremacy. This lifestyle is based on the super exploitation of the non white sector of the domestic working class, as well as countries exploited by imperialism around the world. In America, Class antagonism has always included racial hatred as an essential component, but it is structural rather than just ideological. Since all of the institutions, the culture, and the socioeconomic system of U.S. capitalism are based on white supremacy, how then is it possible to truly fight the rule of capital without being forced to defeat white supremacy? The dual-tier economy of whites on top and blacks on the bottom, even with all the class differences among whites, has successfully resisted every attempt by radical social movements. These reluctant reformers have danced around the issue. While winning reforms, in many cases primarily for white workers only, these white radicals have yet to topple the system and open the road for social revolution. The fight against white skin privilege also requires the rejection of the vicious identification of North Americans as white people, rather than as Welsh, German, Irish, etc. as their national origin. This white race designation is a contrived supernationality designed to inflate the social importance of European ethnics and to enlist them as tools in the capitalist system of exploitation. In North America, white skin has always implied freedom and privilege. Freedom to gain employment, to travel, to obtain social mobility out of one's born class standing, and a whole world of Eurocentric privileges. Therefore, before a social revolution can take place, there must be an abolition of the social category of the quote-unquote white race. With few exceptions in this essay, I will begin referring to them as North Americans. These quote-unquote white people must engage in class suicide and race treachery before they can truly be accepted as allies of black and nationally oppressed workers. The whole idea behind a quote-unquote white race is conformity and making them accomplices to mass murder and exploitation. If white people do not want to be saddled with the historical legacy of colonialism, slavery, and genocide themselves, then they must rebel against it.
So the quote-unquote whites must denounce the white identity and its system of privilege, and they must struggle to redefine themselves and their relationship with others. As long as white society, through the state which says it is acting in the name of white people, continues to oppress and dominate all the institutions of the black community, racial tension will continue to exist, and whites, generally, will continue to be seen as the enemy. So what do North Americans start to do to defeat racial opportunism, white skin privileges, and other forms of white supremacy? First, they must break down the walls separating them from their non-white allies. Then, together, they must wage a fight against inequality in the workplace, communities, and in the social order. Yet it is not just the democratic rights of African people we are referring to when we are talking about, quote-unquote, national oppression. If that were the whole issue, then maybe more reforms could obtain racial and social equality, but no, that is not what we are talking about. Blacks, or Africans in America, are colonized. America is a mother country with an internal colony. For Africans in America, our situation is one of total oppression. No people are truly free until they can determine their own destiny. Ours is a captive, oppressed colonial status that must be overthrown, not just smashing ideological racism or denial of civil rights. In fact, without smashing the internal colony first means the likelihood of a continuance of this oppression in another form. You must destroy the social dynamic of a very real existence in America being made up of an oppressor white nation and an oppressed black nation. In fact, there are several captive nations. This requires the black liberation movement to liberate a colony, and this is why it is not just a simple matter of blacks just joining with white anarchists to fight the same type of battle against the state. That is also why anarchists cannot take a rigid position against all forms of black nationalism, especially revolutionary groups like the Black Panther Party, even if there are ideological differences about the way some of them are formed and operate. But North Americans must support the objectives of racially oppressed liberation movements, and they must directly challenge and reject white skin privilege. There is no other way, and there is no shortcut. White supremacy is a huge stumbling block to the revolutionary social change in North America. The Black Revolution and other national liberation movements in North America are indispensable parts of the overall social revolution. North American workers must join with Africans, Latinos, and others to reject racial injustice, capitalist exploitation, and national oppression. North American workers certainly have an important role in helping those struggles to triumph. Material aid alone, which can be assembled by white workers for the Black Revolution, could dictate the victory or defeat of that struggle at a particular stage. I am taking time to explain all of this, because predictably some anarchist purists will try to argue me down that having a white movement is a good thing, that blacks and other oppressed nationalities just need to climb aboard the quote-unquote anarchist good ship, a ship of fools, and all of this is just Marxist national liberation nonsense. Well, we know part of the reason for an anarchist anti-racist movement is to challenge this chauvinist perspective right in the middle of our own movement. An anarchist anti-racist federation would not exist just to fight Nazis. We need to challenge and correct racist and doctrinaire positions on race and class within our movement. If we cannot do that, then we cannot organize the working class, black or white, and are of no use to anyone. This has been Anarchism and the Black Revolution, written by Lorenzo Comboa Irvin, read by Sen Naomi Kirschultz. Thanks for reading along.